So this is going to be a short video on subsequences. So we're going to look at what subsequences are, look at the formal definition of a subsequence, get used to some of the notation for subsequences, and then we'll prove that if a sequence converges, then all of the subsequences also converge, and they converge to the limit of the overall sequence. So firstly, what is a subsequence? So let's say we've got a sequence, which we'll call the sequence A. So A1, A2, A3, and we'll write out a few more terms, so A4, A5, etc. onwards. A subsequence is a sequence itself that is made by taking a subset of the terms from the original sequence. However, you're not allowed to change the order in which the terms are going to appear when you create your subsequence. So really, it's effectively going along and you just say for each term whether you want to include it or not. So, for example, this is an example of a subsequence. Five, and then it might go on like that. Or, um, obviously, all the rest of the terms are going to need to be consistent as well, but these ones have been selected correctly. So for each term of the sequence, what you effectively do is decide, do you want to include it in the subsequence or not? So A1, you can either include it or not include it. Here we've included it. Then the next term along, A2, include or not include, we haven't included it in this subsequence. A3, you can include, not include, we haven't included it. The next one we've included is A4. So A4 then appears as the second term of our subsequence. And then A5, include, not include, we've included it, and so on. So you, for each of the terms of the sequence, the original sequence, you decide, do you want to include it or not include it? And then the ones that you don't include, you get rid of, and the terms on either side of those ones that you've got rid of then become neighbouring terms. An example of something that is not a subsequence is where you have reordered the terms of the sequence. So if you've got something like this, A3, A1, a5, that's not a subsequence because you've suddenly swapped around the order of the terms A1 and A3. That's not allowed. They have to remain in the same order. So all you're effectively doing really is deciding which terms you want and which terms you don't want. For some formalization of this idea then, so the formalization of a sequence then is that it's a map from the natural numbers, and I suppose I should add that we're not including zero, so from the natural numbers without zero, so that we start at one, to the real line, because we're dealing with sequences of real numbers. So the formality then of a subsequence is that you now need some function, which we might call s for subsequence, and it's going to be a function from the natural numbers, again, without zero, to the natural numbers again, without zero, and it needs to be a function that is strictly increasing, which means that if you go to the next natural number along, so the set, remember, of natural numbers without zero is the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so this is the domain of your function. So if you t look at what s is for some natural number little n, in fact, I might actually just change what letter we're using now. I'm going to change it to i. So if we take some general natural number i and we consider what s is mapping it onto, it's going to be another natural number because that's where the codomain is. And we want it to be the case that if you go... No, and I've written this incorrectly. Let me rub this out. So we want it the case that if you take s of i and then you compare it to s of i plus 1, that s of i plus 1 is always going to be strictly greater than s of i. Let me give you an example of such a function, because I think that will help in understanding how this corresponds to what I've just described as the intuitive notion of a subsequence. So here is a little portion of our domain of this function s, our subsequence function, um, written out here. And then this function is going to map them onto natural numbers themselves. So maybe 1 might be mapped onto 1, for instance. 2, then, what can it be mapped onto? Well, it can be mapped onto anything apart from 0, which I've taken out because I don't want 0. I don't want a 0 of term. Um, and it can't be mapped onto 1 either because then it wouldn't obey this property. So s of 2 has to be strictly greater than s of 1. That's 
what it means when they say that this function has to be strictly increasing. So it could be mapped onto 2, or it might, let be, let's say, be mapped onto 4. And then if I think, what can 3 now be mapped onto? Well, it can be mapped onto anything apart from 0, and it can't be mapped onto 1, 2, 3, or 4 either. It's got to be mapped onto something that's greater than 4. So maybe it would be mapped onto 7, and then 4 could be mapped onto 10. So you get the idea that as you go down here, these numbers are going to have to be strictly greater than one another. That's what this inequality is capturing here. And now the reason that this relates to this idea of a subsequence is now what you can think about doing is this is our subsequence function here, and now we can think about composing this with the function a. So we can think about having a of s of i. So we can use this function that is the formalization of the original sequence on the answer as to what s of i is equal to. So 1 will be mapped onto the first term of the sequence, 4 will be mapped onto the fourth term of the sequence, 7 will be mapped onto the seventh term of the sequence, 10 will be mapped onto the tenth term of the sequence. That's the function a. And now the composition of these two functions, a composed with s, which we could write like so, a composed of s, that's going to be mapping, and I should have left more space, let me rub this out and move it over here. So this mapping, a composed with s, is going to be mapping the natural numbers without zero. Overall, it's going to be mapping them onto the real line. So again, it is a sequence, and it is going to be this captured idea of a subsequence because I can now write this out in sequence form. So the first term, 1 is overall being mapped onto a1. The second term, well, we need to look at where 2 is being mapped to. 2 is intermediately mapped onto 4, so it's mapped onto the fourth term of our original sequence, but now that's going to become the second term of our subsequence. And then 3, it's going to be mapped onto 7 by the subsequence function, and then 7 was mapped onto the seventh term of the sequence. Now the third term of our subsequence is going to be the seventh term of the original sequence, and so on. So the fourth term is then going to be a10, etc. So you can see how this formalization of we're imagining we have this subsequence function mapping the natural numbers onto the natural numbers, of course we're barring zero here because I don't want the zero of term, that is going to need to be strictly increasing. This is actually going to capture this idea of selecting terms in an appropriate way, in an ascending way, that we're going to include in our subsequence. So the collection of all these different functions that satisfy this strictly increasing property, they are all the different ways that you could take a subsequence of a general sequence A. So time for a little bit more notation. So we often denote the terms of a subsequence by A sub N, and then we subscript the N now, I. So whilst we would denote the general terms of the original sequence, A sub N, to denote the terms of the subsequence now, we denote this a sub n sub i. And the way this works is now i is the index of the subsequence. So when i is equal to 1, that will correspond to the first term of the subsequence. When i is 2, that's the second term of the subsequence. i is 3, that's the third term of the subsequence. So a n 1, a n 2, a n 3, a n 4. Etc. This is how we could write the subsequence out. And then the n1 is going to be the number, the term of the original sequence that 1 is mapped onto by the subsequence function. So in this case, n sub 1 would have been 1. So n sub 1 is equal to 1. n sub 2 in this case is 4. n sub 3 in this case is 7. n sub 4 is 10. And then if you put those in place of those and in here, you then obviously have the correct terms from the original sequence. So that's a little bit of notation there. So actually really n sub i is just going to be equal to that subsequence function evaluated at i. So the final thing I want to do is convince you that if the original sequence a from which we're constructing subsequences is a convergent sequence itself, then all the subsequences 
are going to be convergent as well, and they're going to converge to the same limit as the original sequence. So let's say that limit as n approaches infinity of a n is equal to some l. And now, if we consider the limit as i approaches infinity of some subsequence a sub n sub i, that's also going to be l, and that holds true no matter which subsequence you take of this sequence. And I want to convince you of that. So remember, if the original sequence converges to a limit, it means that the terms of that sequence get to and stay indefinitely close to that limit L. So here's the limit L on the real line. We can take any epsilon interval around that L. So here it is, L minus epsilon to L plus epsilon. And there will exist a point, a term, a big nth term in this sequence such that for that term and all terms after it, they are inside that epsilon interval. So here's my sequence A. And there must exist term A big N such that for all little n greater than or equal to big N, so for all little n greater than or equal to big N, they are inside that epsilon interval. And you must be able to do that for all epsilon. That's the epsilon definition of the limit that this thing satisfies. So now why does that mean that this is going to satisfy the epsilon definition? So we need to find a big I in this case, such that for that big I and for all little i's after it, that these are inside that epsilon interval. So let's write out the subsequence here. So we have a n1, a n2, and we want to show that there's going to be a n big I such that all of the terms after it are inside that epsilon interval. Well, why does that hold true? Well, it's simple because just take a, t a big I such that n sub I is greater than big N. So if I make n sub I greater than big N, then all of these terms will be part of this tail end of the sequence here and therefore will lie inside the epsilon interval. Now, how can I be sure that I can find you an, a big I such that n sub i is greater than big N? Well, if you couldn't, then the subsequence would have to be finite because it could only contain this finite number of terms prior to a big sub n. So at some point, the subsequence must contain a term that's within this tail end. And that can't, it can't be the case that it's finite. If you're not convinced of that yet, then let me go back to this formalized of the definition of a subsequence, remember that the function from the index of the subsequence, it goes on, you know, the domain here goes on forever. So it's going to be mapping them onto these n sub i's. So remember, this is n sub i here, this is i, and then this is a n sub i. And whatever big N is, there must be a point that you can get to in this domain where the thing that it's being mapped onto is bigger than that big N because this is going to get indefinitely large because it's, you know, the smallest it could possibly be. If I take an I here, the smallest number it could possibly be mapped onto by the subsequence function is going to be itself. And that's the really boring subsequence where you've had one being mapped onto one, two being mapped onto two, three being mapped onto three, four being mapped onto four, five being mapped onto five, all the way up to i being mapped onto i. That's the smallest thing it could possibly be mapped onto i. For any more interesting subsequence, it would have to be mapped onto something bigger because you've skipped out numbers. And because of the strictly increasing property, that means that this is going to end up being bigger and bigger. So at the for the most boring possible subsequence, you can always find an i such that n sub i is going to be greater than big N because for the most boring one, you could set i equal to n and then the value that it would be mapped onto would be n and then it would be in that realm. For any more interesting sequence, it's actually going to happen much sooner that you're going to get to a term that is beyond that big N. So overall, what I hope I've convinced you of there is that there will be a point in the subsequence where the terms are in this tail end of the original sequence. You must get there at some point. There must be a big I is an element of the natural numbers such that n sub big I, 
the term that it corresponds to in the original sequence is inside this tail end of the sequence because of the way we define subsequences. So you can then use that term that's inside this tail end of the sequence as the first term in your subsequence, which has to be inside there. And then you know that all following terms in that subsequence are also going to be in this tail end of the sequence and therefore are also going to be in the epsilon interval. So yes, for the subsequence, it's also possible to find a term for which that term and all terms beyond it are going to be inside this epsilon interval. And that holds true for a general epsilon. Nothing about our argument required it to be a specific epsilon. So it holds true for all epsilon. And therefore, that subsequence does satisfy the epsilon definition of converging to the limit L. So we'll leave it there. Thank you for watching.